right. Well, thank you, Anne, for having us and for, for doing this webinar. Um, everybody, this is Dr. Ann Reed. She's the current director of the National Center for Science Education. Um, do you have like a special subtitle? Um, I know like there are different directors of different parts of it. I, I'm the executive director. Executive director. There the you director go. Director of all directors. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, so the, the part of NCSE that I work with is like the teacher part. Um, so we do teacher support and we help develop lessons. Uh, and then we go around and we, you know, teach other science teachers how to use the lessons and how to teach different scientific topics effectively. But, but Anne is in charge of, of a couple of different aspects of the National Center for Science Education. One is working with teachers. One is Kind of looking at uh, at like legal aspects that might pop up uh, with states that might be trying to teach science um, in an inappropriate way, uh, and then we have like community outreach and things like that. So, um, and this is uh, part of my class. Um, probably about a fifth of the students that I have uh, who were available and didn't have any uh, softball games or anything like that. Um, and who were really curious and, and interested to come. Great. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, the National Center for Science Education is uh, almost 40 years old. It got started back in the 80s when there were a lot of people trying to um, make it possible for teachers to teach creationism in public schools, uh, either in addition to or instead of evolution. So that was the organization's first um, mission. About 10 years ago, we added the teaching of climate change to our mission because we were seeing a lot of the same kinds of efforts to either encourage or force teachers to um, teach climate change as if it's not settled science, which it is. So we also um, got involved in that. And as, as uh, Blake said, should I call you Mr. Touche? Is that what the kids no, call Mr. You? Blake. <laughs> Mr. Blake. Okay, that sounds good. Um, uh, we uh, work with teachers, especially who teach those topics, evolution and climate change in places where there's a lot of public um, distrust of those areas of science or misunderstanding of those areas of science. Uh, and we do still uh, go to work if there are efforts to undermine how those topics are taught. For example, um, five or six states every year generally update their state science standards. And sometimes there are people who try to water down um, evolution or climate change in those standards, or again, try to require teachers to teach them as if they're still not settled. Um, and so uh, those are our two main areas of work as, as Mr. Blake said, helping teachers teach these topics and then making sure that nobody interferes with them from the outside. I'm hoping that instead of just you asking questions and me answering them, that we can have a little bit of a discussion about the topics that were raised in that misconception of the month article of, you know, that's people on the one hand think that science is all about finding the truth and that scientific facts are just facts that never change or, you know, scientists are changing their minds all the time. First they say this, then they say that it's just a bunch of hot air. Um, and and to, to try to get a sense of how do we decide where on that spectrum um, does any particular finding fall and, and how do we figure that out? Um, so in, in your article, you had written about like the misconception of like science is like a box of facts. So like, where do you think that misconception starts or like where does it stem from that, stat that science is like very static and concrete rather than dynamic? Well, in my uh, pet hypothesis is that that's what you, that's the impression that you get in school that, you know, you start from the very beginning learning science words and, and science facts and, you know, voc science vocabulary um, and in um, physics, you learn, you know, formulas that, you know, F equals MA and that, you know, that's not going to change. Um, you're not usually in school exposed to the part of science that is, you know, still sort of that is dynamic. You're reading a textbook and it feels like, you know, that science is what's in between the covers of this book. That's what science is. Um, you're not learning about the 
the process of how did all those facts get in there? Um, how did people decide that those things were right? And when do they decide that they're that they're not right anymore? Um, or, or that there's a better way to explain it than we explained it 40 years ago. Um, so that's where I think it comes from. Anybody have any other ideas? Well, I don't have an idea. I have a, I guess it would be a question relating to this. Um, I agree with what you're saying about how um, this box of facts comes from the idea of that's what we're taught in school, like we're taught vocabulary and all this. But do you think that um, the the way that we're taught science should be changed to not have this way of thinking that science is concrete and not dynamic? Yes, absolutely. And and not only should we change, but we know how to change. This is not news that science shouldn't be taught um, as if it's a box of facts, that it should be taught much more as it's practiced. So. You know, you'd spend a lot more time having conversations like we just did about what's a negative control and what's a positive control, and and maybe looking at um, looking at an article in the paper and and having a class discussion about well what were their controls and how many people were in the study and how did they decide this and hey did they calibrate that machine right, um, so that you would start to you know e even in you know elementary schools start to realize that question that science is way more about asking questions than um, memorizing words. Um, so we do know how to do that. I know that Mr. Blake is an expert, um, but um, certainly my generation, uh, we, we tended to get a pretty cut and dried science education. Like I said, it wasn't until I actually got a job in a lab that I had my first experience of, oh, that's how science works? You don't know the answer before you go in? What is this madness? Uh, that's an interesting observation, Danielle. Uh, yeah, so I mean, the way that the traditional curriculum has been built is, you know, you learn a little bit, and then every year you kind of get dig deeper and deeper and deeper into it. Um, so I think that's, again, we're just kind of reinforcing facts on facts on facts. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I have three kids, and they all took you know, they had biology in middle school and then they had biology, intro biology in ninth grade. And then they all took AP biology their senior year. And they just felt like we're learning the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and and they were right. They just had to learn more words um, about the same topics. And, and that's a real shame. Uh, I was once on a committee when I was at the National Com Academies with um, the Dean of Sciences at at Harvard and um, he had tried an experiment where instead of teaching intro biology, they had, I can't remember, six or eight different sections um, that were topical. So you might take, instead of taking intro biology, you might take um, HIV virus or you might take, um, you know, uh, African savanna or you might take, you know, ocean, um, ocean food chains. And you would learn all of your biology around that topic. And, and so instead of going through again from, okay, let's talk about biomolecules and then cells and then tissues and then organs and then ecosystems, you would learn, you know, if you were doing HIV, you'd learn about viruses, learning about the HIV virus, you'd learn about the immune system, you'd learn about um, cancer and why did, why do AIDS patients get the certain kinds of cancer that they get? You might learn about, um, how uh, antiviral therapies work. So learn about um, biochemistry of how those um, drugs block the virus. So you would learn all of the same breadth of, of um, topics. You just would learn it through a different lens. And I think it would be a lot more interesting if we taught more like that. And at some point you do need to learn the basics. You do need to learn kind of what Otherwise it is just gonna be really inefficient if you don't know what any of the names of any of the things in the cell are and you've got to describe, you know, it's that little squiggly thing that makes the energy, that thing, it's much faster, just know it's called a mitochondrion. But, um, but you, you'll learn those things a lot better if you're learning them because there's a question that you want to answer rather than just because you've got to regurgitate it on a test.
So going off of what you just explained, which as a student, I would be way more interested in taking a class like that than taking not Mr. Blake's class, but like um, sophomore year biology. Uh, but why do you think we aren't taught in that way? Like, what is your opinion as to why today's curriculum is textbooks and cut and dry and not encouraging us to learn science by questioning and stuff like that? Yeah, it's a great question, Mallory. And it's not only true of, of science, it's true of a lot of areas of of, um, of school, you know, I think a lot of times history is taught as well, just memorize the dates and the names of the people and, and, um, you know, that's not really going to teach you how, how we know what we know about the past, right. Um, but the thing that is um, really tempting about teaching that way is that it's super easy to standardize it. So you have a better chance of everybody is getting the same science education and you can measure how much they've learned by giving them a standardized test. And, and there is a value to that, right? I mean, it's sort of disappointing that, that, that that's the reason, but you wouldn't want to have a situation, I don't think you'd want to have a situation where you know, if you go into 10th grade at your school and you have Mr. Blake and you have a, you know, a fabulous experience of having, you know, your whole year centered around, you know, the biology of a pond that's on your school's grounds. Um, but somebody, you know, the next school over has a teacher who has no idea what he's doing and, and the students, you know, really learn nothing. Um, at least, you know, if you've got a textbook and you've got a standardized test, you can sort of see, you can sort of compare everybody to each other. Um, I think that that's probably the reason that that it's so tempting to teach this way, but we definitely know it's not the best way to learn. Um, but the the challenge of making sure that the, that the teachers are up to teaching in this much more creative and open-ended way, um, and that we can tell whether the students are getting, you know, getting a good education and learning is, is, is a lot harder. And there are a lot of people working really hard on trying to figure out how to make that, um, make it the norm instead of the exception. Yeah, we, we can have that conversation in class if you want, but it's the same thing with like the common core math. Um, a lot of parents absolutely hate it um, because it's new to them. Um, even though like my first grader has more number sense than a lot of adults that I know because of the way that they're learning math. Um, so uh, curriculum changes are, are difficult because, you know, if we start teaching science in a different way, the community, your parents and, and other people who did not learn science that way might not think that it's an effective way to learn uh, or they might not say, why is this so difficult? Why can't you just read a textbook? Uh, so they put pressure on politicians and politicians put pressure on other people. And um, so even though it's, it is a, a more efficient way to learn, um, it's, there, it's, it's very complicated. Yeah, you education. know, what I think is the real tragedy of it, and I don't know if any of you guys fall into this category, but when science is taught in that way of you just got to memorize a bunch of stuff and you've got to be able to reproduce it on a test, um, that selects for, to choose an evolutionary term, that selects for a certain kind of person. Um, and I, you know, freely admit, true confessions, I was that person. Give me a list of stuff to memorize and I will memorize it. Give me a standardized test, I'm gonna ace it. Um, and so I thought that meant I was good at science. Turns out that's not really what makes you good at science. Um, and so I, I feel like we end up losing a lot of people who would make fantastic scientists um, who are either aren't good at memorizing or just think memorizing is pointless and they don't want to do it. So they'll go study something else. Um, because really what makes a great scientist is, is curiosity, is um, this sort of relentless problem solving drive, like loving puzzles, loving to try to figure out why something is the way it is. How could I test that? Um, that those are the characteristics that the people who can say, oh, I saw this thing. And then I saw that thing and that made me think maybe they're connected somehow. 
you know, you know, the kind of people I mean, who are just, they, they think creatively, they put ideas together in new ways. Those are the people we really, really want to go into science because they're going to make the big discoveries, not the people who can ace, you know, the, the AP exam, although I want you all to ace the AP exam. Um, so I guess what I would say is if you find science, if you find that aspect of science boring, the, the memorizing part, but you like the these sort of bigger questions of how would I tell if something's extinct? How would I tell how long coronavirus lives on a surface? Then don't don't give up um, because that means that you'll really like science. And if you can just suffer through some bad science classes because you got to you know check off that box, do it because when you get to the other end and you actually start doing science, it really is a very uh, creative and fun if often frustrating, because like I said, most of the exper experiments don't work. Um, it's really a fun uh, thing to do with your life. Okay, guys, uh, I know that I promised you <laughs> that, you know, uh, this wouldn't take all night. So do you have like, maybe one more question? Or uh, does anybody else have like a follow up? And then we can kind of wrap things up. I, I don't want to kill the discussion, because I think that you guys are, are having a good discussion. But do you have any suggestions for the students to kind of, you know, work on that type of confidence, like building confidence? Yeah, it's um, it's tough. It's really tough. And and I'm not going to lie. It's a big problem in science, especially for women um, and people of color. That um, you're you're often going to be um, told you don't know what you're talking about. The one saving grace of science in that regard is it is in the end evidence-based. And if you have the best evidence, then, then you can start to develop the confidence to go up against even people who are you know, very senior and very knowledgeable in their field because you've done your homework in the sense of you've done the experiments, you've done the controls, you really, you, you know, you've really um, nailed something down. And, and I think that science is also, even though it has problems with, with, with sexism and racism, just like every other part of our society, it does at least um, have an, an, an ethos. It has an, it, the, its goal is to be evidence-based. And so, you know, over time, you do become more confident. And, and the way science is set up is to sort of train you into that. Um, so one of the things that you would start to do in college and definitely in graduate school is something called a journal club, where you you bring an article to um, to the to the group, a scientific article, and you go through it and you talk about what they did and why they did it and what they showed and what you think of it. And then the whole group just tries to tear holes in in that study, tries to figure out what they did wrong, what they left out, what might be missing, so that you kind of practice um, really digging into a scientific argument and deciding whether you find it credible or not. And, and when you do enough of that, then you start to have some confidence in your own ability to make a good argument because you've seen all the ways that people might, you know, poke holes in it. But it's definitely a process, you know, that you, you, you don't start out confident, you kind of have to fake it till you make it. Um, but, um, but the best, I mean, for me, the, what makes me the most confident is when I have really done my research. So I feel like I have the evidence at my fingertips and, and if someone um, disagrees with me, I can say, well, but then how would you explain this? Or, and then there was this study that said that and that reinforces what I was saying. Um, that, that's, for me, that's the, that's the armor I put on is, is evidence. All right. Well, thank you, and that was uh, that was really great. Um, and I'm sure that they're going to have a ton of questions tomorrow that they didn't think of tonight. Um, and thank I wish I could be there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I wanted to thank thank you and and Paul, who's behind the scenes, and thank all my students for giving up their uh, you know their their Tuesday afternoon uh, to come and and talk. Um, but uh, do you have anything that you want to say to kind of close us out? 
No, just thank you for giving um, an hour, uh, a little bit more than an hour of your time to talk about science. And um, if you have questions that come up, send them to me. Um, I'm happy to happy to hear them. And uh, I wish I could see all your faces. I wish I could be in your classroom with you. Um, you're lucky to have Mr. Blake and he's lucky to have a great class like you. So thanks again. Thank you.